Urgent genome sequencing in the case of an Air New Zealand crew member with COVID could provide more clues to where they got infected. The person tested positive during routine screening in China and was flown home yesterday on a freight flight to avoid contact with other passengers. The crew member and seven of their close contacts are now in quarantine at Auckland's Jet Park Hotel. And health officials have been investigating and tracing the case as if it were a confirmed community case in New Zealand. Public Health issued a list of Auckland locations visited by the crew member shortly before they flew to China. ESR's racing to complete the genome sequence for this case and will compare it to others on a database. I asked ESR scientist Yup Delect if there's no match with another New Zealand case, does that mean the infection was caught overseas? We have an almost complete picture of everything that is uh, around in the country, um, but there's still the very small uh, possibility that um, it is something that we haven't picked up yet in the community. Um, as I say, that is a, a small possibility because since that there is good testing in New Zealand and we have a near complete picture, but it's something that we cannot exclude um, as a possibility. How complete is that picture when it comes to genome sequencing? I mean, what percentage of all COVID cases in New Zealand would have been genome sequenced? Yeah, so um, overall, over the complete... Um uh, overall, of the complete overview of uh, cases, um, there would be about an 80% coverage. And um, in terms of uh, the last couple of months, that is 95, 90% complete. And it has to do with there's a couple of cases where we sometimes don't have enough RNA to actually um, get a complete genome out, but it is almost as complete as we can have it. So when you talk about RNA, does that mean that the sample size you've taken uh, does not have sufficient material in it to give you a complete sequence? Um, yes, and that could be because the person was uh, infected historically and doesn't have a lot of virus in their body anymore. Um, that's what most typically happens, um, or that for some reason there's just not a lot of RNA in the sample. So what's realistic in terms of a goal in sequencing? So some you will never be able to sequence properly because of that, but what are you working towards? Um, so we're trying to stay above that 90% line. Um, we will try to sequence any sample just to be sure that we can get as close to that mark as possible. Uh, but if you have that sort of level of coverage, uh, then you can start to make uh, some conclusions about your, your missing data. Um, and the other thing is that is what is promising is that if it is indeed those historic cases, it's also less likely that they will lead to onward spread. So it's uh, not as bad of a problem if, if you miss them. So you must be information sharing then in order to match these sequences with ones that are taken overseas. So does the information go into some kind of central database or how does it work? Yeah, so uh, there is a, a global database that is called Gizaid. Um, where we upload our sequences and where we can also download other sequences from uh, other countries. Um, so there's, there's quite a good international effort where uh, that sharing happens to allow us with, to help us with these types of investigations. So the information you get from a genome sequence, what can it confidently tell you? What's its value? Um, so in this case, if we were to find a link to one of our New Zealand genomes, uh, that it is very similar to that, that tells us with quite some certainty that they are part of a same transmission chain, as we call it. So that means that in terms of investigations, we can start to look at how those two pi people might have interacted. And that probably is through an additional person, but that we can start looking for the missing links. Um, if we wouldn't find a link to, an internet, to a New Zealand genome, we can then look at those international genomes. If it is very, very close to one of those international genomes, that makes it more likely that it is uh, what we call a travel-related uh, infection, where we might start to look more in detail at the airports or the airlines involved um, with the movements of a certain person. Okay, so this um, is where we get to the nitty-gritty. I just want to interrupt briefly here. How sure can you be, what, I mean, by what percentage, that one case is connected to another? 
Um, so that really depends on what the genome yields. Some genomes are, are quite unique, um, some of the ones that we have in New Zealand, because we have a quarantine system. They have not spread to anywhere else in the world. So if we find a mutation that is like that, that hasn't been seen anywhere else, that is quite certain. Uh, but if it is a sequence that is widespread across, across the globe, um, then it becomes less certain. So it really depends on the individual genome that we find, how certain or uncertain we can be. So in the simplest of terms, can you just explain for us, so we can kind of visualise this, what is a genome sequence? Um, yeah, so it's, it's 30,000 A's, T's, C's and G's um, in a row. And that is what the genome sequence looks like. So if, if you have a piece of paper, imagine that being full of those four letters um, and in a, quite a fine print, that's the genome sequence of the virus. So that's the simple explanation? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, and, and, and if, if, if we want to abstract that even further, um, it's, it's, it's a bit like um, uh, that, that every virus carries a book of instructions. And those instructions, when it enters the human cells, they are used to make more copies of the virus. And that's that book of instructions that is the genome. So... Is it fair for me to characterise it as kind of like a fingerprint for the virus? Um, well, in, in, in a sense, it's, it's almost the recipe that defines how the virus is made. And, and then sometimes in that recipe, changes happen. Just like if you get a recipe from the internet and you read that there's only one clove of garlic and you really love garlic, you might make three, two or three cloves of garlic. Um, that is your version of that recipe. And if you then hand that recipe over to another person, they will have that starting version with more garlic in it. Gotcha. Right. Now, that's, now that is clear to me. When you get a chain of infection, and let's just use the defence um, case as an example, because we've got persons A, B, C, D there. How close will, a, will the COVID genome sequence be, say, between case A and D? Will it be almost exactly the same? Will there be a slight variation or how do you know that there are people in between those two cases, A and D? So in that particular cluster, all but one of the genomes were identical. So they're the exact same recipe, so no changes were made. And that is in increasing the confidence that they were recently related to each other. So they're, they're, that recent interaction must have taken place. So just... Can you clarify for me then, if they're exactly the same or almost exactly the same, how do you know that A gave it to B as opposed to the other way around? Yeah, so that's, that's where the, the genomes of this virus do not tell you that much. That's where the epidemiological investigation that the public health units and our epidemiologists um, get into play. It's about uh, when does a person start showing symptoms, um, what was their movement, what was their context, that will dictate uh, the direction of that transmission chain. And as the chain gets longer... Do you expect to see a variation and, and how much of a variation in the genome sequence? Let's say if you had a case A and we get right down, um, you know, hopefully never, to, to case W, would you expect those sequences to be hugely different? Yeah, so, so every time that the virus uh, goes to a new person, there's that chance for a difference to occur. So the more pre people it goes through, the larger the chance that that happens. So what we, for example, saw in August um, up in Auckland was that at some point we had uh, cases that were four mutations or four changes uh, away from the original outbreak. Um, so as time progresses, you expect those mutations to occur. So if all of a sudden you would find someone that has two or three mutations away from what you knew previously, that's when you really start scratching your head about missing links and those types of things, because that must have passed through multiple people to accumulate that number of mutations. And that was ESR scientist Dr. Jupp Delect there.